Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 411th episode, I've got probably the most significant dinosaur discovery from Africa this year. That's quite a claim. It's pretty cool. Yeah. We are also talking about a new ceratopsian that kind of got leaked earlier in the year. Cool. And we have a bunch of other news. Mm -hmm. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Oshalaya, which we usually pronounce Oxalia. I think I pronounced it Wahalia last time, and that was also wrong. So we're all over the map on the pronunciation of this one. It's spelled like Oxalia. <laughs> it's O-X-A-L-A-I-A. It comes up from time to time because it's a Spinosaur, and people like to talk about them. But when I looked into it, it's because it's refers to an African deity, Oshala. So that's why it's Oshala. Yeah. Makes sense. And we're going to be trying a new segment out, which is where we asked on Discord and Patreon for people to give us a dinosaur topic, or I should say just a random topic, and we would try to connect it to dinosaurs. Yep. So we're going to do that. That was a fun challenge. Yeah. And of course, we have a fun fact. But before we get into all of that, Real quickly, we want to thank some of our patrons, and this week we have four new patrons to thank, and they are Geraldine, who said they recently discovered our podcast, so thank you very much for listening, as well as Reed and Alex and Jesse P., who just sent us some really nice words as well. So thank you all for joining our podcast community. I think the Queen Pie suggested that we call our community Die Know It Alls which I really enjoy. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I might start using that. So thank you, Queen Pie, for coming up with that. And then rounding out our shout outs, we've got Elvie, Fog Knight, Alex, Robert, Resident Zeno, and Laurasaurus. Yes, thank you so much. I should mention we also got a few other good suggestions for what to call ourselves. But My favorite is Dino at alls <laughs> It's a really good one. <laughs> also, a quick reminder that SVP is coming up, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, and Garrett and I will be going. It's in Toronto this year, and it'll be uh, the first time we're leaving our baby for a week so we can cover all the dinosaur news. Yep, and as always, we're going to create some special content for our patrons. So if you're not already a patron and you want some bonus content, please consider joining. So jumping into the news, I've got this story which I have really hyped up. It was published in the Anatomical Record, which unfortunately is paywalled, so you can't see all the beautiful pictures unless you want to pay for it. It was written by Catherine Forster and others, and in it they describe a new iguanodontian dinosaur. It's named Ayuku Rothai, and Ayuku is osa for hatchling, Ooh. and Rothai quote, honors Dr. Michael Roth for his substantial contributions to the paleontology of Southern Africa, including crucial early paleontological work in the Kirkwood Formation, end quote. Nice. So you might be able to guess that this was from the Kirkwood Formation. <laughs> hatchlings, that mean they first found a hatchling? They did. They found a lot of hatchlings and some other individuals too. It's crazy. But the holotype is semi-articulated. It includes parts of the skull, lots of vertebrae, shoulders, pelvis, both hind limbs, and some ribs. And there are also a lot of other individuals ranging from like very tiny hatchlings to fairly large-ish subadults. But as a quick recap, iguanodontians are the often, but not always, thumb-spiked relatives to hadrosaurs. Both iguanodontians and hadrosaurs are ornithopods, aka the birdfoot dinosaurs. No one calls them that, but that's what ornithopod means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever heard them called birdfoot. Yeah. I mean, usually people just talk about hadrosaurs and they say the duck billed dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. but, but when you group in iguanodontians. Yeah, then there are ornithopods. There are some others in ornithopods too. It's not just iguanodontians and hadrosaurs. Hadrosaurs are the biggest ones. Hadrosaur, I think, means like bulky dinosaur. <laughs> but nobody calls them the bulky dinosaurs. Either. They are bulky though. They are, yeah. But maybe they don't call them the bird foot dinosaurs because theropods also have very bird-like feet. Mm -hmm. Makes sense because modern birds are theropods. But the three toes that 
ornithopods have usually are a little more spread out than theropod toes. That's generally how they tell the difference when they're looking at the tracks. We have almost no ornithopods from Southern Africa at all. Until now. Yeah. So this new iguanodontian is only the second ornithopod from the Cretaceous in Southern Africa. And from the Cretaceous isn't much of a caveat there because most ornithopods and iguanodontians are from the Cretaceous. It's not just South Africa, but all of Southern Africa. And they took a pretty loose definition or broad definition of Southern Africa because it goes all the way up to Tanzania, Hmm. which is a lot farther north. Usually Tanzania is considered Eastern Africa. So a big chunk of Africa. Yes. The only other named ornithopod in that whole area is Kangnosaurus from the Cretaceous. It was named back in 1915. The holotype is a tooth. So some people consider it to be dubious and not really a, you know, a real dinosaur. Mm -hmm. It's hard when it's just a tooth. Yes, very much so. And that would make Iyuku the only valid Cretaceous ornithopod from all of Southern Africa. (laughs) But there have been several femora assigned to Kangnosaurus, so it has been considered valid by some recent researchers. Although since it was found in 1915, and I think it was found while they were digging a well like 100 feet below the surface of the earth, and they didn't do any sedimentation work on it or anything, so they don't even know what it's from really. They're like, it's probably early Cretaceous because it kind of looks like some other early Cretaceous stuff. Oh, interesting. But it's really not a great find. We don't know much about it. And I keep saying only Cretaceous ornithopod, but even if you expand to the entire history of dinosaurs and, you know, all the Mesozoic and everything, it only adds one more dinosaur in Southern Africa, and that's Disultosaurus, which was found in Tanzania. Although, again, Tanzania isn't really in South Southern Africa. It's pretty much Eastern Africa. So it is a big deal. It is very much a big deal. As hinted at earlier, it was found in the Kirkwood Formation, which is in this case, at least this outcrop of it, is in Eastern Cape Province in South Africa, really close to the shore. It's probably a pretty decent place to do paleontology. Might have some nice views. (laughs) (laughs) It's the early Cretaceous, so it is around the same time, probably pretty close actually to Iguanodon itself, which was like 120-something million years ago. Basically, Ayuku is the only ornithopod from Southern Africa with a holotype that's better than a tooth. And they found at least 27 of them. Wow. (laughs) Most of the bones are shuffled up and from very small individuals, most likely hatchlings to young juveniles. All the pictures of the bones, the scale bars are like five millimeters to 10 millimeters. (laughs) Very, very small bones. Wow, hatchlings, yeah. Yeah. They did find one semi-articulated skeleton again. That's the one that they named as the holotype. That makes sense. And they also found a few bones from larger individuals that were probably bigger than just hatchlings. But all of these bones were collected way back between 1995 and 1999 in the last century. (laughs) Just to make it sound even further back. Yeah. If these bones were born when they were discovered, they'd all be able to buy lottery tickets and alcohol and all that kind of stuff Hmm. because they'd be like 23 at the young end do you just like (laughs) making me feel old yeah (laughs) i like making myself feel old too it's Hmm. fun but (laughs) obviously it took them a long time to prepare and analyze these bones for a long time they were known as i can't remember like formation name iguanodontian like we were saying often happens in the meantime but now they have that official name of ayuku The most common bone they found was the femur. They actually found 46 femora. So you might think, why aren't there 46 individuals? Is it because it's left and right? Yes, exactly. And they found 27 pieces of left femora that seem to be unique, although they don't all overlap. But that means that they probably have at least 27 individuals. Could be more. And you have to go by those kind of counts when they're all jumbled up and you can't see what's what. Exactly, yeah. And they're very jumbled up. 12 of the femora are complete. They range in size from 18.4 to 54.7 millimeters long, or 0.72 to 2.15 inches long. So basically, like, on the big end, it's like the size of your pinky Hmm. for the (laughs) whole femur of this animal. For comparison, a 90-day-old 308 broiler chicken femur 
is about 95 millimeters, which is about twice as long. Oh. So this is significantly smaller than a chicken you might buy at a store. That's weird to think about. <laughs> yeah. And these Ayuku were just really tiny. It's crazy how small they were. The smallest individual had a femur that was only about three millimeters or a tenth of an inch across. So small. It's like a toothpick. The largest didn't have a good femur, but its tibia was 34.3 millimeters across. For comparison, a human tibia is only about 21 millimeters across. So the largest one was bigger than a person, probably. Hmm. The length of that tibia was estimated to be about 42 centimeters long, which is pretty close to a human, actually. And it's also about five times the longest juvenile tibia. So there's a pretty good range there. We've got a whole bunch of these little tiny hatchlings, and then we do have a couple bones from bigger individuals that they called young subadults, most likely. Meaning that as an adult, this was probably significantly bigger and heavier than a human. But obviously, they go through such a huge size change, all the dinosaurs did. Yeah. These hatchlings were so tiny. They're smaller than a chicken. Yeah. Way smaller than a human baby as a baby, but way bigger than a human adult as an adult. It's just, I always think that's interesting. Think of the growth pains. Oh my God. It's crazy. All the pieces of skull they found are unfused and scattered as expected for the little baby bones. Mm -hmm. Usually skulls take a while to fuse, so it's not surprising that they got spread out. And they have tons of other bones from the rest of the skeleton. Basically the whole animal, although they are missing the hands, so we can't tell if they had thumb spikes, which is one of the most interesting oh. things about the Iguanodontians. Yeah. Although... Would it have been different for hatchlings? Yeah, it's possible. And that's actually one of the problems when they went to compare this new species with other species. Mm -hmm. Basically, we have nothing but hatchlings. <laughs> and so you're comparing all these hatchlings with adults of other species. Yeah, that's difficult. So yeah, you don't know, is this just something that changed as it got older? And we're just seeing, oh yeah, that's what young iguanodontians looked like. It's not really a unique thing to this dinosaur. Or are they actually unique characteristics that can be compared with older individuals of other species? It's very tricky. They have several jaws found as well with teeth in them. They look really cool. Mm -hmm. The teeth aren't really in dental batteries, but they have sockets and each one has about one replacement tooth in it. Hmm. So they were replacing their teeth, but it wasn't a crazy thing where there were like two, three, four teeth mm -hmm. in one socket. Not like the spinosaurids. Or just ones with big dental batteries. A lot of times they jammed in a oh, whole bunch yeah. of extra teeth. You could describe the teeth as leaf-shaped. I'm guessing that's probably what you'd go with in a dinosaur of the day description. They're serrated on both sides and they have a large ridge in the middle. The authors describe them as ornaments, <laughs> which mm. I think is interesting. And it was more ornamented, meaning that ridge and everything, were on the side facing the cheeks, which also means that if there were other dinosaurs looking at their teeth, they would be seeing all these nice ornaments. I wonder if any dinosaurs use teeth in their mouths as a display structure, it would be really interesting. Like if they like smiled <laughs> and another dinosaur is like, oh, there's a good ridges on those teeth. I, humans <laughs> kind of do that, right? If you've we got a nice do. smile. Yeah, I always notice teeth. It's definitely important when I'm meeting people, I see the teeth and I'm like, oh yeah, good teeth. <laughs> Maybe dinosaurs <laughs> had that too, but the added detail, not just the straightness, but you know, what kind of ridges they have on the teeth and things like, things like that. It's weird. Histology, not surprising, shows that the bones were still rapidly growing. I mean, that's exactly what you'd expect for a hatchling, but it included the tibia that was already larger than the humans. So yeah, it was still growing quite a bit, even that largest bone that they had. They also found several lags in some of the smaller bones, but they seem to be too small to be several years old because they look basically like hatchlings. Mm -hmm. So the authors say, quote, they may have been subjected to periodic stress severe enough to briefly arrest their growth early in ontogeny, and that may have ultimately resulted in their deaths, end quote. Oh. Yeah, it's very sad. That is sad. So basically what they're saying is that multiple of these individuals were going through the same sort of stress events that were slowing down their growth. And maybe killed them. Yeah. Because it was probably something going on in the environment, is their guess. Mm. And they even said that 
based on the sediment, it may have been getting hotter and drier. So it's possible they were just dealing with this really nasty shift in climate Poor where it was getting all hot and dry and arid and yeah, basically got killed that way. Yeah, it's a bummer. They were all excavated from an area of about 15 square meters or 160 square feet, which at first when I looked at that and I was like, wow, 27 individuals in that small of a space mm-hmm, but seems crazy. It's all hatchlings or almost all hatchlings. <laughs> so the little tiny bones. So maybe it's not actually that impressive. <laughs> the arrangement of bones and ages is fairly similar to myosaur finds in Montana in the US. And myosaur was assumed to be fossilized at a nesting site. So the same might be true here. Although... They didn't find any eggshell in this case, Mm. but that could be due to lots of different reasons. It could be that they returned back to that site later as slightly larger individuals, Mm -hmm. or it could be that the eggs just didn't get preserved or that they were off to the side a little bit. You know, it's such a small area that you have to work with. Mm -hmm. They have two hypotheses for why the bones are so mixed up and scattered. One is that they got trampled before being buried. Hmm. And it wouldn't really take much to trample a five millimeter long bone. No. (laughs) But the other hypothesis is that the bones might have been scattered as the mud dried, which is really interesting. So basically, the clay dries with these large cracks in it, Mm -hmm. and the small bones might have fallen into the cracks as it dried. Interesting. And they said that a lot of the bones are arranged vertically, which is kind of surprising unless they were falling into cracks. So that could be why we ended up with all this weird arrangement of these bones. And I I mean, it might also explain why not all of the bones preserved. Maybe the ones that fell in the cracks got the right treatment. You know, they got covered up better, Mm -hmm. fossilized better than the ones that didn't fall in the cracks, for example. So all those leg bones. Yeah, so many femora. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and a lot of tibia, too. They tried to do phylogeny to see what Ayuku is closely related to, and they came up with Dryosaurus and Disultosaurus. I'm sure that's difficult when you've got just the hatchlings to compare to these other dinosaurs. Yeah, exactly. They said it's not really reliable since we're just looking at babies here. But Disultosaurus wouldn't be that surprising because... It's the one in Tanzania. Mm. It's like sort of close-ish in time, but not really that close since that was at the end of the Jurassic. And yeah, it's also pretty far away, like hundreds to thousands of miles. So yeah, but it's better than nothing. And they were saying maybe there were tons of these iguanodontians or just ornithopods in general in Southern Africa, but we just don't know about them because we haven't found them. And it might be kind of hard to find them because we don't have very many good Cretaceous rocks exposed in Southern Africa. Although I think there might be more than we know about because, as we know, Africa is not the best explored in terms of paleontology. So hopefully in the future, we can find more of these things and fill in a whole bunch of gaps that we have for ornithopods down there. Yeah. Well, this, even though it's all mixed up and it's just hatchlings, it's still a great find that there's at least 27 individuals. That's Huge. Yeah, that was really cool. Well, the next dinosaur that I'm going to talk about, it's not as cute. I mean, it's hard to beat hatchlings. <laughs> yeah. But it's a new chasmosaurine ceratopsid dinosaur, Bisticeratops froziorum. And this was published in the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science Bulletin by Sebastian Dahlman and others. It was mentioned. Bisticeratops was mentioned in another paper, which we talked about in episode 358. I think I said earlier it was early this year, but 358 would have been a while ago. <laughs> yeah, like over a year ago. <laughs> yeah. And it was when we talked about Sierra Ceratops. And so we thought that this dinosaur, Bisticeratops, might be coming. And now it has. And it was published in August. Oh, that was the one it was like mentioned in a different paper it and we in, looked it up and we're like, what is this dinosaur? It's yes, not named anywhere. It was kind of leaked. And then I read somewhere that in another version of that paper, they took that name out, hmm. I guess because it hadn't been published yet. <laughs> As a quick recap, ceratopsians, they're categorized into two groups. You've got your chasmosaurines and your centrosaurines. Chasmosaurines are the ones that tend to have the large brow horns and long frills. And centrosaurines tend to have the short brow horns and short frills. Yeah, so we usually say chasmosaurines, think of triceratops, centrosaurines, think of styracosaurus. Yes, so 
This one is a chasmosauri. So the triceratopsy type? Yes. It's usually. <laughs> usually. It, it, I mean, they described a nearly complete skull. So it was. It had a short nasal horn. It had a long brow horn, horns on the side of the face, holes in the frill. The paleo art shows a pretty curved beak and then horns on top of the frill. It's estimated to be roughly 20 feet or six-ish meters long, and that's based on the picture and scale in this paper. So rough estimate from us. That's pretty big for a ceratopsian. Yeah. Because they didn't really have much of a tail to speak of, so that's all bulky body. Yeah. And huge well, and skull. head, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was found in New Mexico in the Kirtland Formation. It lived in the late Cretaceous in the Campanian about 83 to 72 million years ago. The genus name, Bisticeratops, is after the area where the fossil was found, and the species name, Froziorium, honors the late Edgar Frozy, who's the founder of the band Tangerine Dream, hmm. and his son, Jerome, who's a former member of Tangerine Dream and founder of the band Loom. And I read that Dalman, the lead author, is a fan of Tangerine Dream, so... <laughs> He just named it after his favorite musician, basically. I think I saw a quote somewhere that said that the music inspired him or something. That's awesome. For his research. I yeah. love it. Yeah. The fossil was found in 1975 by a field team from the University of Arizona. And like I said, it's a nearly complete skull. It's only missing the lower jaw and parts of the frill. The skull wasn't prepared for a long time. Originally, it was thought to be or belong to Pentaceratops. But now we think that Pentaceratops was about 2 million years older than what's now named Bisticeratops. Hmm. Plus there's some differences in their snouts and other parts of the skull. The skull is a bit crushed. What's also interesting is that there are bite marks on the skull from a predator, probably a tyrannosaur. It's unclear though if the bite marks came because it was hunted or scavenged later but the bite marks aren't healed. And Bisticeratops, the fact that we've got a new Ceratopsian named, it shows more diversity of chasmosaurines in the southern part of the western interior basin, and it shows that this diversity and radiation happened even earlier than we previously thought. So I guess if you're trying to imagine what it looked like, you could think of a Pentaceratops, you get a pretty good idea? Yes, because they did have a lot of similarities. That's interesting. It has bite marks on it that don't look like they healed because that does make you wonder, did it die in battle? Mm -hmm. Or did it die and then something ate it? Yeah. But I don't know. <laughs> it seems like a weird thing to chew on after it's dead, you know, because there's not a lot of meat on a frill or a skull. <laughs> like, <laughs> seems like you bite it if you have to. Otherwise, you focus on some meaty bits. If you're desperate for food. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I suppose there's always the possibility, too, that there's like a tyrannosaur that really needed some extra calcium mm -hmm. that bit off a chunk of random <laughs> ceratopsian frill to get a little calcium supplement. Yeah. Hard to say at this point. Yeah. It's been a while. <laughs> and now we're going to pause for a quick ad break. But when we get back, Sabrina's going to tell us all about a brand new egg. So our next couple papers are about dinosaur eggs. And the first one that I want to talk about is a new type of dinosaur egg that when it was found was full of crystals. What? Yeah. It's a new oo species. This was published in the Journal of Paleogeography by Ching He and others. And they described two dinosaur eggs as a new species. Ooh, species, they're only known from eggs. Yeah, it's like how you can name a, a species based on a footprint mm -hmm. or a species based on an egg or on bones. We usually talk about the bone variant because that's the actual animal. Yep. But yeah, it's cool when they find a new egg type. It is. And they named this a new one because of the size of the eggs. They're on the larger size. Ooh, and cool. the eggshell microstructure, which is tightly arranged, as they described it. There were three eggs found in the Qianshan Basin from the Tianzhou Mountain World Geopark. This is in East China. They're from the late Cretaceous. 
Two of the eggs were preserved in the Geological Museum of Tianjou Mountain World Geopark, and the third was, quote, lost and still in the process of collection, end quote. That's weird. I'm not sure exactly what that means. <laughs> it was lost and in the process of collection. Maybe they have a rough idea of where it is. So they're trying to find it and collect it? I'm not sure. Hmm. But of the two eggs, one is incomplete, one is complete. And the incomplete one was partially broken, and that's the one that's filled with these clusters of calcite crystals. So it looks like a geode. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. The eggs are nearly spheroid, and they're large. The length is like four to almost five and a half inches, or 105 to 137 millimeters. And the width is almost four inches to five inches, or 99 to 134 millimeters. Yeah, it's pretty big. It's not like mega longa two lithid type crazy huge those big over raptor mm. eggs, but for a spherical egg that is pretty decent size. Yeah, and when you see the picture and you see all the crystals, it's really cool looking. Yeah. So they named this egg Shushing Ulithis chianshanensis. And it's a new species but not a new genus. So the chianshanensis is the new part. Shushing Ulithis, the genus, was originally named in 1991, and those are probably eggs of ornithopods. Oh, ornithopods again. Yeah. And then the species name, Chanshanensis, uh, Chansheng is the Chinese phonetic alphabet of the dinosaur egg locality. That's what the paper said. <laughs> so in other words, it's the name of where the eggs were found. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. And it's definitely worth checking out pictures. Our other egg story is about a titanosaur egg, specifically a pathology in a titanosaur egg that could tell us more about dinosaur reproductive behavior. Oh, that's cool too. Yeah. All this interesting stuff inside the eggs. I know. Crystals and pathologies. <laughs> so this was published in Scientific Reports by Harsha, Diman, and others. As I said, they found a pathologic egg, specifically an ovum in ovo. And that's when you have one egg within another egg. So you got, there's two yolks in the, that egg. Oh, there's two yolks. Interesting. This kind of pathology has been found in birds, but not in non-avian dinosaurs before. Yeah. At first I was thinking, because there's a pathology we've seen before where the eggshell is like double thick. Multi-shelled eggs. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's been found in dinosaurs. And that's when there's two or more eggshell layers around one egg. Yeah, I think sometimes there are a whole bunch of them and then they think it's like egg bound and it just keeps layering up and layering up and then sometimes <laughs> it dies because it's like got this egg stuck in there. Ooh. But that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about almost like a twins type situation. Kind of. In the picture, uh, the picture is also really cool for this paper. You see two eggshell layers and it's like there's one layer over the other and there's a gap in between them. Hmm. And so they're thinking that in that gap between the layers, there might have been a yolk before it fossilized because of the way it's preserved. It looks different from, say, turtle, gecko, or other dinosaur and, and bird, the multi-shelled eggs that have been found, which mm -hmm. didn't have a gap between the layers. Interesting. So they think there was like an egg inside a smaller or a bigger egg around a smaller egg. Yeah. And then kind there's of. like a, a separate space for a dinosaur baby in each of them, potentially. Well, I mean, I don't think it works out, but. At least it didn't this time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we know because it fossilized as an egg. Yeah. Nothing hatched out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so they found this titanosaur egg from a nest. It's from the late Cretaceous in western central India, the Lametta Formation. Now, in birds, because we've seen ovum and ovo in birds, it happens when an egg gets pushed back up the oviduct. Oof. There's muscle contractions, and then it meets another unshelled egg. And the two eggs then move down to the glands that produce the shell, and they get encased in a second shell layer. Oh, weird. And if the next ovulation cycle already happened, that first egg, that one that went back up the oviduct, gets new layers of membrane, maybe a yolk, depending on which part of the the oviduct it goes back to. How far back up it got shoved? Yeah. That sounds so horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a pathology. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of possibilities for why this could happen. There's sickness, 
overcrowding. If it, so then there's competition for space and food, not enough food, floods, droughts, environmental stress, lack of suitable substances to build the nest, climate change, just all kinds of possibilities. Now, in this case, since there was only one egg in the whole nest that had a pathology, it seems likely that it was an individual problem and possibly, according to the paper, quote, can be attributed to an old or incapacitated individual following injury or sickness or one that underwent significant stress due to jump scare caused by a nearby predator, end quote. Oh, it got its its yolk scared back up its oviduct? Possibly. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. man. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a startle. That's a terrible startle. Yeah. On the bright side for us, because we get to learn a little bit more, this egg helps show that sauropods had reproductive behavior similar to other archosaurs. Oh, true. Since both non avian dinosaurs and birds can have the ovum and ovo pathologies and the multi shell egg pathologies. That may mean that non-avian dinosaurs, or at least titanosaurs, quote, might have adopted the pattern of sequential laying of eggs like modern birds, end quote. But the authors did mention that they need more data to test this hypothesis. That's cool. Yeah, that aspect of it is really important because I always feel like sauropods are sort of like the least related to the other dinosaurs we talk about the most. Mm -hmm. Because even though they're sauriscians, you know, with the ornithoscolida thing, they kind of get shoved out into their own. And they're very different in the way they grow and the way they lay eggs and a lot of things like that, seemingly at least on the surface level. But to see those sorts of biological similarities to modern birds mm -hmm. sort of brings them back, at least in my mind, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to where the other dinosaurs are at. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I always see sauropods as dinosaurs, but for people whose favorite dinosaurs aren't <laughs> sauropods. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> well, I mean, they're still cool animals, whether or not they count as a dinosaur. They definitely do count as a dinosaur <laughs> and will continue to count as a dinosaur. But yeah. Yeah. There's a paper I want to quickly mention, but I didn't find a way to get access to it. So I'm just summarizing the abstract. Mostly, I really like the title of it. It's A Busy Time at the Beach. <laughs> Multiple examples of gregarious dinosaur behavior inferred from a set of trackways from the late Cretaceous of Alberta, Canada. <laughs> Busy time at the beach. So yeah. Apparently, there were a lot of dinosaur tracks at this spot. Yes, and it might show them being sociable. It was published in Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences, and it was written by Donald Henderson and others. And these tracks were made over a few days or less. They're from about 72 to 66 million years ago, and there's four types of dinosaur tracks. Inferred hatchling tyrannosaurids. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, medium and large ornithomimids, small and medium-sized ornithopods, and a small hadrosaurid. They said six out of seven trackways made by the hatchling tyrannosaurids showed them walking in the same direction. And the ornithomimid tracks also seemed to show two of them walking together, the same speed, same direction, and they even turned together. Cool. Friends, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. You don't hear a lot about hatchling tyrannosaurids. Were they just strolling on the beach at that yeah. busy time? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great title. It is. Yeah, that sounds cool. It's always fun to see what sort of interpretations people come up with for dinosaur tracks. Because mm -hmm. when you look at them at first, it just looks like a whole jumbled mess. But then if you really get in there and you try to identify which track maker is which and yeah. trace out which paths they were taking. You can really piece together a story. Yeah. Whether or not that story is true, it's hard to determine, but it's fun to do. Yeah. I, I mean, it's hard to say what they found exactly from the abstract, but I'd like to think about this day at the beach. Yeah. <laughs> we have some other dinosaur news, starting with a Tyrannosaurus Rex is going to auction soon. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. This one's nicknamed Shun, though the new owner will be able to rename it. Shen weighs about 3,000 pounds or 1,400 kilograms and is about 40 feet or 12.2 meters long and 15 feet or 4.6 meters tall, but it's unclear how complete the skeleton is. It was found in Hell Creek in Montana, and they're thinking it's going to sell for $25 million U.S. Wow. Yeah, it'll be happening in Hong Kong on November 30th. Those prices just go all over the place, though. 
because I think the last one they thought was going to sell for like 10 to 15 and then it sold for like 30 something. Mm. So that's probably why they think this one's going to be near that price. But who knows? You know, there's the economy isn't the same as it was a year or two ago. So it could go for way cheaper. That's true. Because, yeah, these things fluctuate pretty rapidly. I wonder, it's going to probably come down to how complete it is. And like you said, it's unclear. I kind of think it might not be as complete because if it's only 3,000 pounds for a 40 foot long thing, Mm -hmm. it makes me think that a lot of those bones are probably replicas. Because otherwise a single bone is usually like a couple hundred pounds. Hmm. But I don't know. It it's depends. really hard to say. Yeah, yeah, it's like if that's if there's a whole bunch of metal holding it up, and you know, it's it's hard to identify exactly how much it would weigh. But interesting. Yeah, it is. Hopefully, it ends up in a museum, like we always say. Yes. Although, if it's twenty five million dollars, that's hard. Although Stan did right in the oh, United yeah. Arab Emirates. <laughs> yeah, Stan did. There are some countries with a ton of money in <laughs> their museums, so it's possible. Going back to dinosaur tracks, there's some new dinosaur tracks found in Alaska, and that's thanks to a large earthquake, 8.2 magnitude in southern Alaska last July. Wow, that's a big earthquake. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting silver lining. Yeah. Like, yeah, there was a huge earthquake. It caused a bunch of damage, but we found some dinosaur tracks. Yeah. It was in the Aleutian Island chain. So it happened July of 2021, and then Tony Fiorio and a team discovered them this summer, the tracks. There might be 30 new footprints from three different species, one types from an ankylosaur and one's from a theropod. They'll be presenting their findings at the Geological Society of America in Denver, so don't know too much about them yet. But like you said, silver lining. Yeah, that's a pretty good set, Mm -hmm. 30 footprints, and you got an ankylosaur in there? (laughs) What more could you want? We don't have a lot of ankylosaur action from way up in Alaska, so that could be pretty significant. (laughs) I'm not just saying that as an ankylosaur fan. No, no, of course not. It's like an actual new dinosaur to the area, potentially. Yes, of course. (laughs) (laughs) And the last, the Badlands Dinosaur Museum found baby dinosaurs this summer. Ooh, more baby dinosaurs. Yeah. They went to various dig sites in Montana, North Dakota. They spent three months from June to August out on the digs, and they found a bone bed with a lot of hadrosaurs and also the baby dinosaurs that lived around 77 to 76 million years ago. One of the biggest finds is called Rod's Duck. It's a two to three-year-old hadrosaur. They haven't found the head yet, but they have a lot of the body and they've connected those bones that they have found. I'm guessing someone named Rod found it. Probably. They also found a Tyrannosaurus fossil, specifically the bone above the eye. Cool. That sounds like a lot like the Ayuku find down in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Given With the that, babies? Yeah, a whole bunch of baby hadrosaurs. I mean, that wasn't a hadrosaur, but yeah. close. Weren't it the bud? Yep. Now we're going to try out our new segment. And this is connecting anything to dinosaurs. So I want to explain kind of how we got the idea. We came up with it while we were on our parental leave because we noticed that we were connecting a lot of conversations back to dinosaurs. <laughs> and we thought, oh, could we do this with any topic given to us? I feel like I can connect any topic to dinosaurs. It does have to be a topic that I actually know. Mm. <laughs> like if you name a word that I've, I've never seen before, I probably can't connect it to dinosaurs. But if it's something I know about, I can probably connect it to dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the time we were walking through the zoo with some friends and I, every animal we saw, I was connecting to dinosaurs somehow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> So the first one we're going to try out was, I think the first suggestion we got was from Tyrant King, who suggested sandwiches. I'll say, we're still kind of working out how exactly we'll do this segment. So we're trying something out this time, and I'm not yet sure how regular this segment will be. You'll see how much people like it. Yeah. But we got a lot of fun suggestions for topics. So we got to do at least a few of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you want to start with your ideas about sandwiches or should I start with my connections? I know you're really excited. I'm pretty excited about it. I think sandwiches are fun to connect to dinosaurs. I'll let you start. Okay, good. (laughs) (laughs) So first, I want to say Tyrant King answered their own question by pointing out that you can put poultry on sandwiches. 
and birds are dinosaurs. Yeah. And I think basically any food connection to dinosaurs is usually going to go through the bird right. route. Like, oh, you know what chicken tastes like and therefore you know what maybe some dinosaurs tasted like. Sure, or turkey sandwich. Yeah, exactly. My first thought, though, weirdly, was very different than a meat sandwich I've eaten. You teased it on Twitter. No, that's, that's a different thing. Oh, okay. I went a lot of places with this. All right. So the first thing I thought of was a T-Rex biting through three animals at once. What? And like a sandwich. Oh. You know? So like if you imagine like three little animals running by a T-Rex and it like bites all three of them, then it's sort of like mushing them together into a sandwich. Do you think that ever happened? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe, you know, they were around for a couple million years. It might have happened one time with like some hatchlings or something that were slow oh, yeah, and like yeah. kind of densely packed together. Or for some small animals that were dead together and it scavenged maybe. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are ways it could happen, but we don't have any evidence for a dinosaur doing that. But it sort of led me to that thing that I posted on Twitter. My favorite thought experiment of all time, probably. And that's what makes a sandwich a sandwich. It's also <laughs> simplified to, is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> is it? Yes, a hot dog is a sandwich. But it is controversial. I will say, <laughs> do, you, do you think a hot dog is a sandwich? I was going to say no. I didn't used to think a hot dog was a sandwich, but I've been convinced. Okay. So uh, there are two ways to approach hot dogs are sandwiches. Mm -hmm. The first one is that a submarine sandwich is clearly a sandwich, mm, right? You right. consider like you go to Subway, get mm -hmm. your sandwich. The foot long, yeah. Yeah, that's a sandwich, right? Yes. So the bread that is on a sub sandwich or like any kind of roll, like you get a lobster roll or mm -hmm. something, that's the same exact type of bread that you have on a hot dog. That's a good point. So if you're going to do that and it's still like meat on the inside and it's just... And you add the other ingredients to it and all that. But with a hot dog, it's like the hot dog is the main ingredient. And in a sandwich, yeah, there's the meat or whatever protein you have, but there's also the lettuce and the tomato or whatever, not just condiments. Whereas I feel like with hot dog, the only thing you add is condiments. But you could have like a simple hamburger and that's still a sandwich. A hamburger is a sandwich now? Yeah, hamburger is a sandwich. Huh. It's just on a bun. It's Ooh. not on like regular bread, but still a sandwich. Then the other thing is, if you're not focused on the, the contents of it, mm -hmm. so you're, you know, you're sort of like, well, what about the condiments to lettuce ratio? Ice cream sandwiches are sandwiches. <laughs> and if an ice cream sandwich can be a sandwich, then the ingredients clearly are not that important. So mm. it's also cookie witches. Yes. <laughs> There's this really good graphic called the sandwich alignment chart that I retweeted before this episode. <laughs> And they list the before recording this episode. Yes, they list the true neutral position as a hot dog is a sandwich. But the most interesting piece of it to me is whether or not wraps count as sandwiches. Why? Because it's like, why would that be a sandwich? You've got it's just like food with a, a thing wrapped around it. To but me, is it, a, isn't that what a sandwich is? A sandwich is to me is when it's you have two things around a third thing. But a wrap doesn't count. Because that's just one thing wrapped around a thing. It's not two things <laughs> oh smushing a thing. Anyway, there's also the possibility that a calzone counts as a weird enclosed sandwich mm. even farther down the craziness than a wrap. But <laughs> that's enough about what a sandwich is. There's another separate thing called the cube rule of food identification. But I think it's flawed because it literally is inside the box thinking. They take the sides of a box and then they define like, well, how many planes does it have? And that tells you if it's a sandwich, basically, if it just has like a top and a bottom plane. Mm, on get it. out of here with your in the box thinking. Yeah, exactly. And they define a hot dog <laughs> as a taco, which is just crazy. Oh, yeah. Wait, how come tacos aren't sandwiches? They could be. So that some people think tacos are sandwiches. I don't think they are because to me, they're saying it's covered on three sides. Mm -hmm. I think a taco is just one wrapped piece, you know, around. That's what makes a taco taco. You take like a single thing and then wrap it around three oh, sides of something. And you think a wrap is not a sandwich, so then that uh, Yeah, works, exactly. Right? I feel like it needs two sides. Are we too far from dinosaurs now? I can bring it back. Okay. <laughs> so 
the reason I'm bringing all this up is because in order to find if a dinosaur ate a sandwich, you have to know what a sandwich is. I see. And I don't know what a sandwich is, really. I think a hot dog is a sandwich. I don't think a taco is a sandwich, but maybe it is. (laughs) Calzones probably shouldn't be sandwiches, but maybe they are. I don't know. It's crazy. I have one last aside, though, before I get back to dinosaurs. Okay. Panini is the Italian word for sandwiches. A singular sandwich in Italian is panino. Mm, But we still call it panini when we're ordering. Yeah, but if you're at an Italian restaurant and you order panini... I wonder if anyone's ever gotten like a whole bunch of sandwiches. They're like, you wanted, <laughs> you wanted panini. <laughs> you didn't say how panini. How many? They ask how many. Yeah. <laughs> how many panini? One. No, you said panini. You want one panino? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so with dinosaurs, the first thing that, or the second thing, I guess, because the first thing I thought of was T-Rex chomping through multiple dinosaurs at once. Second thing I was thinking of is ornithopods eating bugs in a log. Do you remember that study from a while ago? They found this dinosaur poop and it was like a whole bunch of wood Mm -hmm. and then it had some crustaceans in it. Mm -hmm. And what they thought was, okay, these ornithopods, they needed more calcium or something in their diet. So they chewed on this log that had a bunch of insects in it Mm -hmm. and they got extra calcium from that. So if that counts as a sandwich, then that would be a dinosaur eating a sandwich. Oh, okay. But according to the cube rule of food identification... That would either be considered a calzone or nachos, depending on the location of the bugs in the log. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it would count as a sandwich. (laughs) (laughs) You really got to get into the definition of a sandwich. You're right. Yeah. So I can't can't come up with a single idea or example of some evidence of a dinosaur actually eating a sandwich. Mm -hmm. The best thing I can come up with for relating dinosaurs to sandwich that we have actual evidence of is a literal dinosaur sandwich. What does that mean? So like the Utah Raptor Project, where they have the huge block of dinosaurs. (laughs) They have several Utah Raptors sandwiched together. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I would say that's a dinosaur sandwich, but like using sandwich as a verb. Sure. You know, not as like a thing you eat. Yeah. Never specified what you meant exactly by sandwich. (laughs) Tyrant King. <laughs> Could have been a verb. <laughs> I also think if multiple Utah Raptors don't meet the definition of a sandwich because they're all the same and you need like two dissimilar things around a, you know, a separate thing. Like mm-hmm. if you have three pieces of bread in a row, does that count as a sandwich? I don't know. I think the middle thing has to be different. Mm. But then you could go with Jurassic Park, The Lost World. There's that scene where InGen is chasing down the dinosaurs in the field and they sandwich a pachycephalosaur between airbags <laughs> to capture it. I think that's also a dinosaur sandwich. Okay. <laughs> and in researching this, I found out that that Hummer with the inflatable bags is called a snagger. Huh. They named it for the show. <laughs> I think it's just fun. One last fun one. If a sauropod oh, steps gosh. on a turtle... Is this fun? ...and its shell splits open on the sides, mm. did it turn the turtle into a turtle sandwich? It didn't eat it. But it, it doesn't have to eat... You don't have to eat a sandwich for it to be a sandwich. It's a sandwich whether or not you eat it. Hmm. But see, it's got like the top yeah, I see shell piece By, and the bottom shell piece no. and the mushy turtle in the middle now. No, no, Because if you're thinking most sandwiches, two pieces of bread, not... One piece of bread that you split in half. (laughs) Oh, good point. Yeah. Yeah, it would have to be a very lucky question mark turtle Mm. to only be split around the the outside edge. (laughs) (laughs) I guess turtles kind of are already sandwiches in a way. (laughs) I guess so. (laughs) Is a turtle a sandwich? That's another question. Okay. So I went a different way. My... (laughs) thought process was a little bit different. I assume you would. I had a couple ideas. First was there's dinosaur cutouts for sandwiches. Boom. Easy. Done. But that's too easy. (laughs) (laughs) Which, by the way, maybe we should get some of those. Make our sandwiches more fun to eat. Maybe. But uh, I like the crust. I do like the crust. I don't want to cut that off. That's a good point. Never mind. (laughs) Then I was thinking about where you eat sandwiches. Picnics. So if we were out picnicking and we were eating sandwiches and we wanted to think about dinosaurs, we might look around us and find some. And in our case, we'd probably see Canada geese. 
because there are a lot of Canada geese in California. So birding with sandwiches? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that got me looking into Canada geese, which is officially called Bronta canadensis. That means burnt black goose from Canada. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Don't call it a Canadian goose. It's not a Canadian goose. It's a Canada goose. Mm -hmm. And some quick facts about them. I mean, they're most people probably know they're known for their V formations when they're flying. They don't all migrate. Some of them, like the ones here in California, they found good homes and they stick around. Yeah, that's true. Baby geese are called goslings and they can learn to swim 24 hours after hatching. And when they're one day old, they can dive 30 to 40 feet underwater, nine to 12 meters. That's very impressive. I can't do that as a 30 something year old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now this one, I really enjoy it. This is according to the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. As goslings grow up, they start hanging out with other young geese and they become part of gang broods. There can be up to 100 goslings in Ooh. a gang brood. That sounds like the birds. And that reminded me of Phil Curry's book, Dino Gangs, where he talks about the idea of dinosaurs as pack hunters. We interviewed him and talked more about it in episode four if you want to hear more about these dino gangs. So back to the geese. Bronta, again, the Canada goose is Bronta canadensis. They're first named that whole uh, genera in 1769 by Giovanni Antonio Scapoli. And the type species is Bronta bernicla. There's six species of Bronta. As a side note, there used to be five, but then the cackling goose was found to be a different species. And that cackling goose used to, they used to think it was just part of the Canada goose. An especially loud Canada goose. Well, it's a distinct <laughs> high-pitched call. Ugh. There's also some sm other small differences, like more rounded heads, shorter necks, very small things, which got me thinking about how we have all these different dinosaur genera and back to the lumping and splitting ideas, mm -hmm. you know, because if we can find these small differences and have different species of birds... Probably happened a lot with dinosaurs. Yeah. There were definitely a lot of species that we can't tell just from the bones alone. Yeah. Mostly, though, I wanted to say cackling goose. <laughs> 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 there have been fossil species of Bronta found. I counted seven when I was looking into it. Some lived in the Miocene about 23 to 5.3 million years ago. Some were in the Pliocene about 5.3 to 2.5 million years ago. And somewhere in the Pleistocene, about two and a half million to 11,700 years ago. And looking into the fossil species, that led me to learn about Vega Vidae. I think that's how you say it. It's an extinct family of geese like birds that lived in the late Cretaceous and survived the KPG boundary. And it's possible they survived because they had a high metabolism and then they grew really quickly. Like they could grow to be adults in less than a year. Nice. So, yeah, a different interpretation from you. <laughs> <laughs> you started with the connection to dinosaurs and then went off on a tangent. I went off on a tangent that connected back to dinosaurs. Yep. Different ways of thinking. So uh, let us know what you think about this <laughs> segment. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about it was, is a hot dog a sandwich and Canadian geese, I mean Canada geese. Just random stuff. Related to dinosaurs. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now we're going to pause for another quick sponsor break. But when we get back, we'll be talking about dinosaur of the day, Oshalaia. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Oshalaia, which was a request from Jaybird via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Oshalaia was a spinosaurid that lived in the late Cretaceous about 100.5 to 93.9 million years ago in what is now northeastern Brazil in the Alcantara Formation. Not many bones have been found, but it probably looked like other spinosaurs. It's closely related to Spinosaurus. It may have been a junior synonym of Spinosaurus. It had this elongated jaw, it probably had short back legs, robust arms, and a long tail. It's unclear if it had a sail on its back because none of those fossils have been found. But if it turns out to be a junior synonym to Spinosaurus, then it probably did have the sail. Then we'll know exactly what it looked like because it'll just be Spinosaurus. That's true. Although I shouldn't say exactly because we don't really know that much about how Spinosaurus looked. It's always changing. <laughs> but we're learning more every year. That's true. The skull of 
Oshalaia, is estimated to be 4.4 feet or 1.35 meters long. Spinosaurus skull, as a comparison, has been estimated to be 5.25 to 5.75 feet or 1.6 to 2.1 meters long. And we go into way more detail about Spinosaurus in episode 300 if you want to hear about the almost most recent news. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's it's pretty up to date. So Oshala Ia is about a foot shorter, head only, yeah. about a foot shorter? Yeah. Oshala Ia is estimated to be in total 39 to 46 feet or 12 to 14 meters long. That's based on comparing its snout to the snout of... MSNM V4047, which is a very large Spinosaurus CF found in 2005. And I think it was the only Spinosaurus it could be compared to at the time. And CF, just for reference, means hard to identify. Oh, for the species. Yeah, for Spinosaurus CF, for this snout. Oshalaia is estimated to weigh five to seven tons. It had teeth that were not serrated. It probably ate fish, but it may have also eaten dinosaurs and pterosaurs. That's based on evidence from other spinosaurids, which we've talked about. The fossils of Oshalaia were found in 1999 on Casual Island. Two partial skull bones were found, and then it was described in 2011 by Alexander Kellner and others. The type and only species is Oshalaia quilomboensis. The genus name refers to the African deity Oshala, and according to the paper describing Oshalaia, quote, the most respected masculine deity in the African pantheon introduced in Brazil during slavery, end quote. The species name refers to the Brazilian quilombo settlements, where descendants of former Brazilian slaves live, some of which were on Casual Island. The holotype of Oshalaia was found in situ and includes the fused premaxillae, which is the front of the snout. An incomplete left maxilla or upper jaw has also been referred to Oshalaia. The holotype was a rare find because strong tides eroded many fossils at the site where it was found. Oh, so there might have been more before. Could have gotten washed out to see before they got there. Could be. A lot, like hundreds of spinosaurid teeth, though, have been found in the same area. Wow. Which, as we talked about recently, spinosaurids, they just had a lot of teeth. They were dropping teeth like crazy. (laughs) Yeah. The partial skull and teeth had distinct features, such as, well, we'll get into that, such as two replacement teeth in each socket and a more rounded tip of the snout. But as we talked about just two episodes ago, 409, in the recent Spinosaurid teeth paper, Spinosaurids had two replacement teeth. So I'm not sure how distinctive a feature this is. Uh Uh-oh. If that's part of what they're hanging the hat on of this being a unique genus. Yeah. Although that's a really recent paper, so. Yeah. But it, it could lose. It could get synonymized. It could. Oshalia had seven premaxillary teeth, but MSNM V4047, that Spinosaurus CF that it was compared to, only had six premaxillary teeth. It's a slight difference. Yeah. In 2020, Robert Smith and others found Oshalia didn't have enough distinct features to be its own taxon and instead said any differences were due to individual variation and that it was a junior synonym of Spinosaurus. And if that's true, that would mean Spinosaurus had a wider distribution than we previously thought because we would have thought before it was only found in what's now Africa. Yeah, that's pretty cool because, well, at the time, South America was still basically connected to Africa, but Brazil was still much farther south. Mm -hmm. So if it was anywhere in Brazil, that means that It would have been in Morocco, Egypt, and down in Brazil. That's a very wide range. Similar animals and plants have been found in the Chemchem beds of Morocco from the same time period. Hmm. And yeah, like you're saying, Africa and South America, they used to be connected as Gondwana. Parts of it were still connected during this time period. Yeah, it's hard to say exactly what, but since... We think Spinosaurus was an okay swimmer. Mm -hmm. It might not have been quite as big of an obstacle as maybe to other dinosaurs. 
Yeah. So I'm not sure what the consensus is yet on if it's a, considered to be a junior synonym or its own. It seems like it might get synonymized. Well, it kind of did in 2020. Oshalaia, the fossils were at the National Museum of Rio de Janeiro, but they might have been destroyed in the 2018 fire. This is very hard to confirm. Oh, no. Another the Spinosaurus got destroyed and the the holotype, at least, and Oshalaia also might have been destroyed. Mm-hmm. That's a bummer. Well, Oshalaia, it lived in a tropical forested area with lots of conifers, and the area was surrounded by an arid landscape. And other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place included Carcharodontosaurids, Dromaeosaurs, sauropods, theropods. Other additional animals included pterosaurs, crocodilomorphs, turtles, and fish. And you can see Oshalaia in the game Jurassic World Primal Ops. And now for our fun fact. I took it over again this episode. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> We had fun with our (laughs) connecting things to dinosaurs. That scratched my itch of random research. (laughs) (laughs) So just for fun, I was thinking if dinosaurs had NASA, they might have avoided extinction. That is very random. (laughs) Yeah. And it's because there was the really big news recently about DART, which I'm sure a lot of people already know about. Oh, I see. Yeah, because NASA has achieved potentially helping to avoid extinction for humans? Yes, exactly. So DART, it's the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. It's a NASA spacecraft that crashed into an asteroid's moon on purpose to see if it could change the asteroid's direction in case, you know, we need to in the future. Oh, it's just an asteroid's moon, Mm -hmm. not the asteroid itself? Exactly. Weird. So the moon is named Dimorphos. That means two forms. It's about... 525 feet or 160 meters in diameter, which is similar in size to an asteroid that could be very bad for Earth Hmm. if it hit. And then the asteroid is named Didymos, which means twin, and that refers to the system that consists of an asteroid and a moon. So since there's this asteroid and the moon, that's how they got the name. And that's about 2,560 feet or 780 meters across. That's half a mile. That's big. Yeah. It's a near-Earth object, which means it's within 30 million miles of Earth. (laughs) It doesn't seem that near, but I guess... I guess. In space, that's near. The good news is it's no threat to Earth, and that is what made it so perfect for testing on. See if we can make it a threat for Earth. (laughs) (laughs) No, they made sure they didn't. (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) But... They did want to test this in case at some point we need to avoid another dinosaur extinction level event. Mm -hmm. It's the first time we've ever done this, but, you know, we've, in sci-fi it's been done. Think Armageddon and Deep Impact, those movies that both came out in 1998. Yeah, that was all the rage in the late 90s. Yeah, it was. (laughs) (laughs) Now, DART launched in November of 2021 the DART spacecraft, and it weighed about 1,260 pounds or 570 kilograms when it hit Dimorphos, and it hit it at about 13,400 miles per hour or 21,600 kilometers per hour. That's fast. Yeah. It was too small, however, to destroy Dimorphos, but the goal was to change Dimorphos' speed and the direction that it was heading. And it's going to change its speed, or it has changed its speed by 1% and shifted it a bit. Hmm. There were cameras to see before and after the impact and some really cool images that have come out from just before the impact, where we saw that Dimorphos is egg-shaped and covered in boulders. Scientists are going to be doing a lot of observations in the coming years to see how things changed. We're already hearing about a trail of like a 6,000-mile trail of debris. Oh, geez. Yeah, which looks pretty in pictures. And in 2024, the European Space Agency's HERA mission will launch and get to Dimorphos in 2026 to study both Dimorphos and Didymos. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, even if you could just move it by 1%, if you're talking about the order of millions of miles, that's Mm -hmm. definitely enough to avoid a planet. Yes. I'm sure if dinosaurs understood astronomy, they would wish (laughs) that they had figured this out. Yep. (laughs) They needed their own NASA. But you know what? That worked out for us mammals. Yeah. 
we there wouldn't be a human NASA if mm-hmm. there was a dinosaur NASA that prevented their extinction. <laughs> <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you're not already a patron, consider joining our community. Get that bonus content when we talk about SVP news. That's at patreon.com slash I Thanks again, and until next time. Get down, get down.